Yes, our next speak, speaker is going to be Douglas Mooney, uh, and he's going to talk about African American archaeology in Philadelphia. Uh, Doug is a senior archaeologist from AECOM, and he has been a professional archaeologist in cultural resource management for more than 30 years. Uh, for the past 20 years, Mr. Mooney has worked almost exclusively in Philadelphia and the surrounding parts of Southeast Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Doug, you can start. Thank you, Kurt, and uh, thank you to everybody for inviting me to uh, be a part of this workshop today. Uh, the presentations so far have all been really excellent and fascinating. Um, uh, as Kurt mentioned, I'm going to sort of present a whirlwind tour through some of the most important African-American archaeological sites uh, that have been found and, and excavated in Philadelphia. Um, there's quite a bit of information that I want to cover in this, so I'm just going to jump right into this. Uh, the image that's up on the screen now shows the locations of uh, numerous uh, archaeological investigations that involve significant African-American components. They may not be the, the only investigations were African-American that involved African-American occupations, but that uh, involves significant African-American components. And these are the only ones that at least that I am aware of. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, the vast majority of these sites uh, were cemeteries or uh, burial sites. Uh, and they include among, uh, included in this are the, the two Africa, first African Baptist church cemeteries, uh, the uh, Potter's Field in Washington Square, the burial site of the amazing uh, Reverend Stephen, Stephen Gloucester, the Blockley Almshouse site, and the African Friends to Harmony Cemetery uh, in West Philadelphia. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't have enough time here today to, uh, to delve into to all these sites. What I'm gonna do is focus on a smaller subset, in particular, um, the, the sites of the National Constitution Center site, the President's House site, uh, and the Bethel Burying Ground in Wekako Square. Um, these sites um, are more varied in form and uh, have the ability to speak to a number of different themes such as uh, African-American domestic life and material culture, slavery in the people's house, and the Black community struggle to create independent institutions and sacred spaces. These also happen to be ones that I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to take part in. We're going to start right away with uh, the National Constitution Center site. Uh, this site is located in the northernmost block of Independence Mall in the heart of Center City, Philadelphia. Um, it was investigated uh, between 1999 and 2003 as part of a compliance work. Uh, the National Constitution Center was receiving substantial funding from the federal government, so this work was carried out as required under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. The uh, site itself covered virtually an entire city block. So this is a huge investigation. Um, the excavations of the site uncovered the well-preserved remains of an entire 18th and early 19th century neighborhood. It encompassed 115 separate house lots and recovered approximately 1 million Native American and historic artifacts. But they, uh, during the uh, late 18th century, the block was populated primarily by Quakers uh, and recently arrived German immigrants. But during that time, it was also home to an unusually dense African-American population uh, for this part of the city at that time. Uh, for most of these black families, we still know very little about their lives and personal histories, but three individuals in this group stand out. Uh, Robert Venable, Israel Burgo, and James Orinoco Dexter all of whom were founding members of the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, one of Philadelphia's first independent black congregations. And the area in this site, which really is the most intriguing is represented by this central area right in here. Uh, this area was exceptionally well preserved uh, with uh, vast stretches of intact ground surfaces pr preserved there and that contained among other things, um, what I think is maybe the most unique artifact assemblage that's ever been found in Philadelphia, at least based on my experience. 
And this is an assemblage that seemed to share numerous similarities um, with certain material char uh, culture characteristics that have been documented, uh, documented at the occupations of enslaved Africans on plantation sites throughout the Southeast United States and the Caribbean. And in some cases may also have analogs in uh, traditional West African cultures. Among the artifacts that fall into this category uh, were literally hundreds of glass trade beads scattered throughout the backyard spaces in there. Um, uh, also included a number of cowrie shells, several of which have been intentionally modified to allow them to be strung uh, on, on cords and worn as an, or, an ornament or an article of decoration. Other uh, artifacts that fall into this category include uh, sherds of, of uh, historic ceramics that appear to have been intentionally modified or napped to create different tools. Uh, and then also examples of, uh, of European coins that have been perforated to allow them to be strung again as probably an, uh, an, an article of jewelry or something similar to that. Um, we're going to really look at, at this site at the, uh, at the two occupations associated with Israel Burgo and, and uh, James Orinoco Dextron, turning first to, to Burgo. We don't know much about Israel Burgo, unfortunately. He, uh, we know that uh, he uh, was a wood sawyer, so somebody who cut and hauled firewood for a living. Uh, he would have been a, 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 at the lower end of the economic scale uh, among even uh, African Americans at the time. We know that he probably was born sometime around 1740 and died in poverty in South Philadelphia in 1818. And we know that he lived on this uh, site from approximately 1791 until at least 1811. And it's kind of interesting. He lived in a home that was located on the property and to the rear of the home of a Quaker schoolmaster, uh, Benjamin Cathrell. So, Burgo's site continues to have these uh, sort of, you know, these very interesting material culture uh, expressions that are found uh, in the site. Uh, and that starts really with uh, the home that he lived in. Surviving historic documents and the excavation of his home revealed that he and his family lived in a small one story wooden post and ground earth fast structure. Uh, and that was a very common building style in uh, many West African cultural traditions uh, and unique among all the uh, house lots excavated at the National Constitution Center site. Other artifacts and interesting artifacts that were found in direct association with Burgo's home include large numbers of uh, Kelowna ware pottery, which were recovered from the wall trench of his house. Uh, and in the privy uh, just outside of his home, we found large numbers of modified ceramic discs, sometimes referred to as gaming pieces, at least one of which has been drilled and may have been worn uh, as, sort of as an article of, of adornment. And then some of the other things that we really don't know what function they serve, but were again unique to what was found on his site. And that's a series of small animal bones which have been incised with Roman numerals. And the Roman numerals represented on these bones go from one to 15. Uh, it's been speculated that potentially these also were some sort of gaming pieces or counters uh, or something else. We don't really know uh, what the function of those artifacts were. Turning to now to uh, James Orinoco Dexter. Orinoco being the name that was given to him by um, his original owner, Henry Dexter. So Dexter was born into slavery sometime around the year 1730, grew up in the home of uh, Philadelphia merchant uh, Henry Dexter and later in the, the household of his son, James. In the 1760s, he was able to purchase his own freedom and shortly thereafter, the freedom of his future wife, Pris, as well. And for the next 30 or so years, he worked as a coachman for uh, the prominent um, Quaker abolitionist, John Pemberton. Uh, Dexter first received or achieved historical notoriety in 1782 when he was one of six men to draft and submit the first ever petition by African Americans to the Pennsylvania state government. You can see that petition here and his signature among the six individuals. In this particular case, they sought uh, permission to fence in the Negro section 
of the Potter's Field in what is today uh, Washington Square. By the early 1790s, he'd become a leading figure in efforts to establish the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, and in fact, the very first organizational meetings to create that church were hosted by Dexter in his North Fifth Street home. Um, he later played a central role in acquiring building materials to construct St. Thomas's first house of worship and served for a time as one of that congregation's first vestrymen. So Dexter's house within the National Constitution Center site was located over on the Fifth Street side. Uh, it probably looked very similar to this 18th century home that comes from a different part of Philadelphia. He rented it from his neighbor, Ebenezer uh, Robinson, a Quaker, brush maker. Uh, the house itself was situated in an area that was eventually to be covered by a bus parking lot and turnaround uh, for the National Constitution Center. And initially when um, uh, the, his home site was looked at, uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty clear that the, the construction that was gonna occur here was relatively minor and would not uh, impact any potential archaeological deposits that were associated with his home. And so in accordance with um, uh, Park Service policy, the initial uh, plan of action here was that Dexter's home site would not be excavated, but would be preserved in place. Um, but as information about Dexter's life, uh, the background information and historical information became better known about him, and in particular about his role in helping to found St. Thomas's and the organizational meetings that he hosted on this spot, the Park Service changed course and decided that, well, maybe we need to think of this, his property uh, as, as sort of a traditional cultural property, and maybe we need to seek consultation with members of the local African-American community and others. Uh, the, the consultants that were brought together to discuss this project eventually uh, included representatives from St. Thomas's uh, Church, from uh, Mother Bethel AME Church, from the Philadelphia Multicultural Affairs Congress, and representatives from um, city government. Uh, when they looked at this situation, they believed that, well, you know, Park Service policy about preservation in place here isn't really an absolute. And in fact, there are exceptions that can be made in the cases of sites that have extreme uh, public interest uh, or, or very significant, are associated with very uh, significant historical uh, events. And they felt that this site uh, certainly fit that bill. They argued their case, the Park Service, and ultimately, ultimately were able to convince them that was true uh, and to change course uh, and the dig was on. So the, uh, the, the excavation itself sought to recover um, any kind of physical evidence, archaeological deposits that could shed life, uh, shed light on Dexter's uh, personal history, the members of his family, and potentially other members of the African American community that occupied this, this large block. Um, the excavations began on September, uh, February 25th, 2003, following a brief uh, convocation ceremony conducted by then the then uh, ministers of St. Thomas and uh, Mother Bethel AME. The excavations were also conceived because of the public interest that was generated by what was learned about Dexter's life. The excavations were conceived of from the beginning as an exercise in, in public archeology, span although on a fairly uh, small scale. So there was a small uh, viewing platform that was erected right next to the site where people could come, uh, members of the public could come in and watch the excavations, interact with the archeologist uh, as the site was being excavated and see the discoveries as they were coming out of the ground firsthand. Excavations here found a number of uh, historic features, including four brick line shaft features. Uh, unfortunately, all of those uh, were had uh, contained deposits that were associated with people that lived around Dexter and either predated or postdated his time here. Uh, and Dexter lived on the block uh, during that decade of the 1790s. Um, but one feature in particular was identified that had the potential to be associated directly with Dexter and the members of his family. And that was about a five foot square diameter uh, wood lined barrel privy. And this privy was fairly 
jam-packed with a material culture that we believe was actually, it can be attributed to Dexter and his family. The, the, the fill within this feature was kind of interesting in that rather than uh, representing, uh, you know, sort of a quick accumulation of, of uh, debris and rubbish thrown into this, this privy, into this pit, it rather was consisted of a series of thin overlapping layers that appeared to represent slow gradual accumulation of material, and it was it was interpreted initially that maybe what we're seeing here is evidence uh, of a material being deposited in here as part of yard sweepings, which again was a, a, a common practice in many West African traditional West African cultures. The artifacts that came out of the the privy here included many average day to day artifacts that spoke to daily life in the Dexter house, like. Uh, wooden toothbrushes, buttons, and clothing fasteners, uh, sewing needles and thimbles, and, and a whole manner of, of uh, other artifacts. And it also included a number of ceramic sherds associated with more, what would have been more expensive imported tablewares. Uh, most members in the African American community at this time probably wouldn't have been able to afford the purchase of these items, but clearly Dexter was able to, uh, to provide um, uh, nicely for his family and set a fine table uh, for his family and also for the guests that he invited invited into his home. Um, there was also um, uh, a significant numbers of, uh, of food remains that were found within the privy uh, and that included animal bones uh, that indicated that he and his family enjoyed a broad diet that included beef, lamb, pork, fish, and poultry. Um, and a significant portion of these bones indicate that he was able to afford the more choice cuts of meat um, in, when feeding his family. Um, but also what was found in here were large numbers of the bones from pig's feet. Now, pig's feet were a common component uh, in the diet of enslaved individuals in other parts of, of the country. And in this instance, what what, how they were interpreted, you know, even though Dexter could afford nicer uh, and more, more high on the hog cuts of meat, uh, that maybe these rep, these bones represent a form of comfort food uh, that may have invoked uh, a sense of identity and family for Dexter and uh, the members of his household. So while the excavation of Dexter's home produced no real earth shattering new discoveries, um, they were considered to have been a success and worthwhile undertaking by all parties. Not only did the dig focus substantial attention on Dexter's previously unknown personal story and achievements, but also created an opportunity for members of the public to learn, uh, many for the first time, to learn about the 18th century birth of Philadelphia's free black community and of the group of black founding fathers who helped create the bedrock social institutions that made that possible. Um, and today, the stories of Israel Burgo, Dexter, and others uh, are included in one of the most popular exhibits within the National Constitution Center, and all, as well as 3D printed uh, replicas of some of the artifacts that were recovered from uh, their individual uh, properties. So in a larger context, uh, and getting ready to move forward to the next site too, um, the activation of Dexter's home established the essential groundwork for community activism and publicly oriented archaeology uh, that it ultimately achieved much fuller fruition a few years later in the excavation of the President's House site just a few blocks away. So the President's House, which is depicted uh, in this painting from 1830, was located just two blocks to the south of the National Constitution Center site on block one of Independence Mall and was located right at the southwest corner of the intersection of Market Street and Sixth Street in really what is one of the busiest intersections in all of Philadelphia in terms of their, its foot traffic and whatnot being associated uh, very closely with Independence Hall just to the south. Um, and this is the site where Presidents Washington and Adams during that 10 year window uh, when Philadelphia served as the temporary capital of the United States, where those two presidents literally invented what it meant to be an American president. Um, and it's also a house where it was later discovered uh, George Washington during his tenure on the site 
at various times brought as many as nine enslaved Africans up from Mount Vernon to serve in the household staff uh, of this executive mansion of what was the White House of its day. Uh, despite the, the significance of this site, the fact that it was, you know, the White House of its day and associated with Presidents Washington and Adams, um, this is a site that uh, its very existence and even location uh, was complete, almost completely removed from public memory over time. Um, and that's for, you know, fairly obvious reasons. The house itself was heavily modified after Adams left the house in 1800. In 1832, it was torn down and replaced by a series of larger uh, commercial buildings, all of which had deep underground basements. Those buildings were in turn demolished in the 1950s uh, in order to create Independence Mall. And then the 1960s, sort of the final indignation uh, occurred here when a public toilet was built directly over top of the site. So the site itself was rediscovered in around 2002, when a local historian named Ed Lawler published uh, what was essentially an architectural history of the site um, that described details of what the house looked like, how it evolved over time, where exactly it was located. Um, and the images here sort of give you a sense of where all that was situated on the site. And you can see the new Liberty Bell Center in the background here. Um, almost as an afterthought, Lawler's research also included that information for the first time about um, the enslaved uh, uh, individuals that Washington brought here into the house. Um, the information about the, you know, the, newly, the new rediscovery of the president's house, and particular, the discovery of uh, Washington uh, having kept slaves in the house really sparked uh, a public outcry um, with um, people throughout the city, you know, calling for um, something to be done to commemorate this site, to mark it, um, and, uh, and also to see if anything can be learned, uh, could be learned at the site about the enslaved individuals that Washington brought here. Um, Waller's research also uh, made clear that the president's house itself uh, was actually a complex of buildings. There was the main house that fronted on Market Street, which served uh, uh, state functions and administrative functions, and then a whole series of more functionally oriented back buildings that stretched 180 feet uh, back uh, into the block. Some of the areas of the President's House site are now, or at the time, uh, sealed beneath the Liberty Bell Center. Um, the thing, the one piece of information here that really shook people was Lawler's discovery that a small structure that Washington had built to house the, his enslaved stable uh, workforce uh, and that uh, sort of became known widely as the slave quarters was situated directly beneath the entrance to the new Liberty Bell Center. So anybody going into um, the center to see the very symbol of American freedom and liberty first had to cross over the site uh, where people were held in bondage on this property. When all this information came out, there were a variety of groups that formed um, to protest and to try to get something done um, to tell the history of the enslaved Africans that were here. That included groups like, um, uh, one group was called Generations Unlimited, but the principal one was the Avenging the Ancestors Coalition for Attack. Uh, for two and a half years or so, these groups marched, staged protests, um, uh, cajoled, argued um, with Park Service and city officials um, that it wasn't enough to simply commemorate the President's House and Washington and Adams with anything that was going to be erected on the site. That instead, more needed to be done to, to flesh out the lives of, of those enslaved individuals who were brought here against their will, and specifically like with the, the, uh, the occasion uh, with Dexter's site, uh, Attack and others argued strenuously that there needed to be an archeological investigation of this site, even though anything that might've been preserved in the ground was, was not originally going to be impacted by uh, any kind of memorial construction or anything like that. They argued that this again was one of those exceptional situations where preservation in place um, was not sufficient. And they argued for archaeological excavation, even though um, even the Park Service's own assessment of the site uh, gave it 
at best, a low to moderate uh, potential for containing any sort of archeological deposits that could be directly associated with um, that period when the site served as the, the executive mansion, the president's house. So ultimately um, these groups were, were uh, they prevailed. Um, the city agreed that yes, uh, this needs to be excavated uh, and the city um, put forward the money to, to make that happen. This also built again on the lessons that were learned in public archeology span from the Dexter site. And again, it was always conceived of as an exercise in public archeology, span although on a much grander scale. So this time there was a large public viewing platform that was built directly on the edge of the site. And again, uh, this afforded the, the, the people who came to visit the site um, an opportunity to view the, the uh, excavations to see what was coming out of the ground in real time with the archaeologists about, about the discoveries here. Now, what was found? Um, ultimately, this project succeeded beyond anybody's wildest expectations. And that was despite the fact that the site proved to be, in a sense, artifact poor. And meaning that there were about 19,000 artifacts that were recovered from this site and, and a number of, of deep um, brick line shafts and privies and whatnot um, that existed below those deeper later 19th century basements, but all of the artifact deposits recovered from the site uh, postdated the president's house time period. No artifacts in here could be directly tied to, um, uh, to Washington or any members of, of his enslaved workforce. But where it did succeed uh, it was most unexpected because it did recover um, uh, again, un unexpected in some cases, previously unknown fragments of the president's house itself. Um, and that those fragments ultimately connected both with the, the office of the president and with the enslaved individuals kept here by Washington. So among the, uh, the um, fragments of the house itself that were found, is this curving wall right here, which is the foundation of a two-story semicircular room that Washington had added on to the back of the main house, uh, the back of the state dining room, probably looks something similar to this uh, uh, house in the uh, uh, London Hill State. Um, so it's sometimes called a bow window, but really it was a two-story semicircular room. Never knew that it actually had foundations that extended down to the basement level. So, uh, which is what this represents. This is the back wall of the main house, the bow window uh, foundations. Um, both Presidents Washington and Adams used this curving space in, in this room uh, to greet guests in the state dining room and uh, at uh, other official uh, functions, and both used that space to help create uh, one of the first visible symbols of the office of an American president. Modern historians of the White House down in Washington, D.C., do believe that it was the shape of that space that influenced um, the, the construction of the Oval Rooms in the present day White House, including um, the president's Oval Office. So in, in a very real sense, this was um, sort of the original Oval Office. Other uh, fragments of the house that survived and again, against all expectations, were parts of the back buildings behind the main house, including outlined in blue here, the foundations of the kitchen, which is where, uh, uh, among other things, um, Washington's enslaved chef Hercules Posey, uh, renowned chef, produced sumptuous meals for Washington's family and household and the guests that he entertained. Um, there was also a, sm a smaller sub-basement within um, the kitchen, which probably served as a root cellar cold storage facility. Uh, and then again, previously unknown, the remains of, a, of an underground passageway that connected the basement of the kitchen with the basement of the main house and would have allowed uh, Washington's um, uh, uh, workforce, both enslaved and free, to move back and forth between those spaces without being seen or disturbing um, the guests up in the main house. That was not a, an unusual feature for some of the large manor houses of, of this time, but again, it was not something that was previously known about the house itself. Um, 
all the discovery of, of these of all these different fragments um, really provided visitors to the site with a, a real connection. It, it gave them a real sense of time and place, uh, enabled them to transport themselves back to this location into these spaces uh, and really sympathize with the, the, the uh, plight of the individuals um, uh, that were on this, this property and with the presidents themselves. It allowed them to, to, uh, to get a really visceral connection um, with this house and the importance of the site. And the people came. This was a huge um, uh, uh, outpouring of support for this project. The, the site itself was open only for four months. As a matter of fact, it's one of the only projects, it's the only project that I've ever worked on in my life when our client, the city of Philadelphia, twice told us to slow down and make this last longer. That never happens. But over the course of that four month period, um, there were more than 300,000 people that visited uh, this site and that stood on that viewing platform to uh, see this site and to learn about the history of the enslaved individuals here and to come to terms themselves with what that meant, to, to develop their own interpretations of what that meant. It was a very powerful, moving experience. This story was also picked up uh, by more than 400 individual media outlets throughout the world, which helped spread this story to an even greater audience. Um, and uh, one of the things, pieces of information that was spread through all this, this uh, this news and whatnot was, uh, it was eventually learned that the plan for when the excavation was done would be to backfill this site and to build the memorial on top of that. And of course, it was necessary to backfill the site to some extent in order to preserve those, those very fragile fragments of the president's house that were exposed. Um, but there was an outcry of outrage uh, among the public uh, that this was going to be backfilled, that you would not be able to see anything again after this. Uh, they, many people wanted the, the site, the entire site left open in perpetuity. Uh, in the end, it forced the city and their design team to completely rethink the design of this memorial and ultimately in, to incorporate um, a, 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 a glass vitrine viewing window into the site, which, allowed, which was climate controlled and which allows visitors to this day to look down into uh, what was considered to be the most important part of the site. So people can see that fragment of the bow window, the, the foundations of uh, the, the uh, kitchen where Hercules worked and that underground passageway that connected uh, both the main house uh, and the kitchen. So again, um, that, that public activism uh, saved the day and produced really tangible results. And the last site, that uh, I'm going to get to today is the Bethel Burying Ground at Wekako Playground. This is I'm going to give you a, sound, uh, a time check, Doug. So uh, hey, where are we at? Uh, <laughs> you're pretty much done. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap this up real quick then. Okay, sorry. Oh, thank you, though. Um, so the, the Bethel Burying Ground it occupies uh, a little over a quarter of an acre beneath what is today Wekako Playground. Uh, it was a, a cemetery purchased by the Reverend Richard Out in 1810 and was actively used up until about 1864. Over the course of that time period, it's estimated that perhaps as many as 5,000 members of the early 19th century African-American population of Philadelphia were buried on this site. Uh, it was another, again, another site that was lost to time, in part because the cemetery was, was sold in 1889 to the city of Philadelphia so that the congregation could fund the building of its new church. Uh, the, the city turned it into a, into a public park. For a time in the early 20th century, it was transferred, transformed into a public garden. Uh, and then ultimately after 1912 into a, set, into a playground. Um, the site was rediscovered by the work of a local historian named Terry Buckaloo uh, who's done a tremendous uh, of job uh, documenting the, the names of individuals known to be buried here. He had, now has uh, about 2,500 names of people that were known to be buried in these grounds. Archaeological investigations were conducted in 2013 when the city was in the process of trying to renovate the playground. And the, the, the purpose of the archaeological investigations was try, to try to determine um, were there still burials present and, and about how far down below the ground surface. And pretty quickly, they, um, discovered, they were able to determine that yes, in fact, there were. This is one of the, the trenches that was excavated and at about two feet down, 
in a space that measured five feet by eight feet in total size, there was evidence uh, of no fewer than 19 individual grave shaft outlines uh, that could be picked up uh, in the soil of the site. So this is a very, very full uh, cemetery to this day. Uh, and the, the remain, remains of these individuals do still exist on the site. Other excavations at the site were able to, tr to identify the outer walls of the cemetery, so its exact placement could be determined. And one of those, a small fragment uh, of a headstone that commemorated the life of Amelia Brown, uh, who died in 1819 at the age of 26, was, was found and recovered um, from the site. After the excavations were done, again, huge public outpouring, the city got involved, uh, formed a um, essentially a steering committee to try to determine how the site should be commemorated uh, and, and, and in what form and who was going to be involved in that. Uh, that process took years, involved uh, a search for a public art installation that was finally awarded last year uh, to this artist, Karen Olivier, a local Philadelphia artist. Uh, and her uh, installation named Her Luxuriant Soil uh, is planning to be built over top of uh, the location of the cemetery uh, this coming summer. So uh, this, this will be uh, incorporated into the site. It'll incorporate, among other things, a decorative gate, like others uh, found on 19th century cemeteries, plantings and other things that actually will, will invite members of the local community to become involved in the, in the upkeep of this site. So I'm going to end this um, presentation now just with a, a plea. Um, this overview hopefully has shown that Philadelphia possesses a tremendous potential for informing of us about its historic African-American population and for providing insights into the lives of both free and enslaved Black individuals who are largely ignored by the historic record in life. Um, we need help. Um, Given the uh, tremendous building boom that uh, Philadelphia has experienced over the past several years, an unknown number of historically significant sites, some of which are no doubt associated with people and events important to the city's African-American heritage are being irreparably damaged or destroyed every single day. Now more than ever, the kinds of public action and engagement discussed here are needed now in order to prevent yet undiscovered and irreplaceable archeological sites from being lost forever. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. That was really an excellent presentation and certainly um, a necessary plea at the end. But there's no question that these resources are being lost uh, at this time. I don't know, Sherry, do we have time for any questions? We don't have any specific to Doug's um, presentation. The general consensus that I keep seeing in the Q&A is how do we get community activism started? How do we raise the awareness? How do we get volunteers? Um, and how do we get our legislature to care and, um, and, and act upon some of our uh, cemetery laws and, um, you know, improve our preservation of cemeteries across the Commonwealth? Uh, so those are some things that whether you want to address those right now, Doug, or we want to save those uh, for the end of the day. Um, well, I will just say the one thing that can be done in Philadelphia specific, uh, you know, right now there is uh, the main preservation body in Philadelphia is the uh, Historic Commission, and there are currently no archaeologists that are part of that, um, that organization. And so uh, the preservation and protection of archaeological resources inevitably takes a backseat. Uh, that, is a rem that is a situation that can be easily remedied by the mayor. Um, and it, it really just takes that kind of activism and arguments and, and cajoling to try to get the mayor to, to ratify that situation. At least then there will be people in city government that are actually looking for these sites. And that's a necessary first step to ultimately protecting them. Yeah, Thank you. Thank it's you. interesting. They had a pretty active, uh, the historic, the city had a pretty active archaeological program, I guess, in the early 80s and did away with it at that time. It's unfortunate. Right. But then when that person left at, in the late 80s, that they were never, never replaced. Right. It's very unfortunate. 